Hi guys, James Chai, Arf Arf Bark Bark Rescue Foundation, and this is September 30th, 2019, episode number six. Uh, I'm going to keep trying to do as many as I can uh, daily. Um, again, I, I'm trying to figure out what the feedback is and so forth, and I'm going to try to make some articles uh, from some of the comments of, uh, of what I've done in regards to um, um, stuff. Okay, so today I'm just going to talk about a couple of things. My battery is almost dead, so I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, two things. One is going to be about dogs peeing in the house, and then the other one is going to be about asking why I, I always ask people for photos of their dogs. And um, for those of people who have worked with me before, they will know what I'm talking about, and we go from there. So um, the first thing is, so I, I'm in you know a couple of dog training groups, and obviously my... My type of work is not something that a lot of people understand. And of course, because they don't understand it, then they're always aversive to so forth like that. And I do want to say is I provide and do evaluations on a psychological level of the dog on the root basis and understanding what goes on on that end. And so uh, when it comes to that part, and I'm just going to kind of fix this here. Hey, Darlene. Hey, Stephanie. Um, so when it comes to that part, when I work with dogs, in my, my category, I work with the dogs that are predatorial, the dogs that have uh, significant uh, dysfunctions, that they have significant histories. Sorry, I'm just going to turn this off here. That they have significant histories, and these are dogs that have attacked people, that have uh, been quite vicious, and um, you know they're usually 150 pounds or heavier, and that's just where my mindset is. And so working at this level that I do, which I call V10, that level is right at the top. Hey, Pedro. Um, so what that is, is I'm working at this level, at, at a level 10. I'm working with the dogs that nobody in the world can work with. And a lot of times people say, you know, he's full of crap and all that stuff that whatever. I've never turned down a dog, not not aside from the newspaper articles and the television and stuff like that. I've never turned down a dog. I've never recommended a dog to be killed. And I have never been wrong on any evaluation of any dog that I've ever met. And anyone that has worked with me can attest to that. And so the reason why I say this is because I believe that every single dog can be trained. The dog is not broken. The dog is not disrupted. Yeah, Pedro, I am now. Yeah, getting out of my little uh, quiet little universe here. Um, but yeah, so every single dog that has reactivity, every single dog that has some sort of behavior issue can be trained they can be rehabilitated they can be stabilized absolutely the, the dog that has attacked 10 people can all be dealt with the dog that has killed other animals as tragic as that is that dog can be addressed with their prey drive and their predatorial drive and that's the point right because the dog industry just talks about dog training and says oh you know the dog trainer and then there's the it's a prey drive and the behavior says, yeah, well, the dog is a predilection to attacking other animals because it's a primal aspect. And, uh, oh, thanks, guys. <laughs> thanks, Pedro. Um, but the reality is every single dog has prey drive. Every single dog has play drive. Every single dog has a predatorial drive. If we can accept that point, then we understand there's a greater, deeper, wider envelope to the dog's psychology. And that's what I do. So when I work with the dogs that are the impossible dogs, the dogs that everyone says cannot be dealt with, I say to them, you know what, let me deal with it. It's not a big issue to me. These are straightforward issues. You see the videos of uh, Diesel, the Great Pyrenees that was, uh, you know, 120 plus pounds, semi-feral, etc. Two sessions and he was calmed down. No treats, no medication, etc. So it's connecting to the dog on a visceral aspect. And a lot of times a dog has dysfunctions. And that dysfunction runs from their aspects of their history. So a lot of people who adopt dogs will have adopted dogs that, most times are pretty cool. And then there are going to be people where you say, you know, my friend adopted a dog and their dog is quite skittish or, or reactive, etc. And those dogs, without knowing their background, the owners, the families don't know what to do and they sort of struggle and they go to people who treat train the dog with dysfunctions. And so treat training a dog with dysfunction doesn't help at all because again, it's like a human being. If you have a dysfunction, if you were assaulted violently, the last thing you want is for someone to give you a bunch of treats uh, to tell you to go out drinking, etc. So that's not the way 
we address the dysfunction. And with the dog, they don't have the ability to process, so we address the dysfunction directly by addressing the dog's psychological issues at his nuanced behavior, which the dog operates at about one-tenth of a second. That's why medication doesn't work on dogs. It is a quick fix situation. And if you look at the fact that the, uh, the pharma, big pharma, they spend on human trials billions of dollars on dogs. Hey, Sandy, uh, how's Cody? How's Cody doing? Um, so with, uh, with human aspects, big pharma is spending tens of billions of dollars on, on the trials. When it comes to dogs, they're spending in the tens of millions. And that might sound like a lot of money, but that is realis realistically one or two, three percent. So there's no long-term studies done on other than the fact that, you know, the dog didn't die. And when a dog is put on medication, it causes the dog to go into a fog. The dog doesn't know what is going on. It's like someone slipping a, a drug into your drink at the bar and suddenly you feel woozy and you're trying to fight that. That's what's happening to the dog. And that's why the dog's behavior fluctuates up and down. And that's why the vet or the behaviorist or the trainer, who I, unbelievably they can prescribe this stuff, that's why the medication doses, dosages go up and down. Hey, Rita. Um, yeah, and I got your message, Rita. That's why the dosage goes up and up and down, up and down, because they don't know what's going on. So they're just going to keep medicating the dog like it is some sort of uh, Jack Nielsen character out of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, up and down, up and down, until they find something. And then the dog themselves has no idea what's going on, and they continue to struggle and fight that. And because the dog is predacious, predatory, right, predacious in nature, they don't know what that fog is going, and they just keep fighting it. And then the, the conclusion is, well, there's no way to fix this dog, etc. And that also goes to the part of treat training. Again, it's being counterintuitive, etc. So in one of the groups that I'm in, uh, and I'm not in a lot of training groups just because um, it, it just, you know, it's the same remedies over and over again. And those remedies are treat training the dog or whatever stuff. And it's just like, you know, you're, you're, it's like you're drawing crayons on the wall. And one of the things I've always said to people is when I hear stuff like this, when I read stuff, when I read stuff that out of Temple Grandin and all these other well-known like Ian Dunbar, all the stuff, it's literally like me listening to a child tell me why the sky is blue. All these people are scratching the surface. They have no idea what's going on. Thank you, Pedro. Yeah, I know, right? After like three, four months, you guys spent over a grand on it, and now it's just like, it's apart, and, and just, and you're such a beautiful couple. Um, but yeah, so, um, and and again, you know, it, to me, it's, it's you know, it, it was funny. I was just saying to a friend of mine, Debbie, on the phone tonight, I was watching a movie last night called A Beautiful Mind, and with the Russell Crowe character, and he's a mathematical genius and so forth, and what somebody said about the character that he's playing, they said about the character, was that, uh, he's the kind of person who knows the answers before he even sees the question. And that's the definition of genius. I'm not a genius. I just see things in a, in a very quick manner, which everyone else can and when I teach people how to do it. So that's where I'm at. And I think that we should get away from the treats and we should get away from the, the medication when it comes to dysfunctional dogs that are at a high level. On a lower level of dysfunction, it's absolutely totally cool. But on a higher level, it doesn't. So in one of the groups that I'm in, the question was uh, that one of the trainers had posted, you know, up for anyone to answer was, any suggestions or advice on a dog that's constantly marking in his home, right? So what can we do about this dog that's always peeing inside the home and he used to be aggressive and territorial in his space, but we got that taken care of, which means treat training, right? You know, that's a bribery aspect of not addressing the, the dysfunction. So it says, you know, used to be territorial, Hey, Crystal, used to be territorial, used to be aggressive, took care of it, but now he continues to pee in the home. And then they're saying, you know, uh, the owner's making sure that he's cleaning up the messes thoroughly, hoping someone might come up with some ideas or something that I thought. And of course, if you look at the fact that there's such a limited envelope of understanding of the dog's behavior psychology, you don't have anything else to do. You're like, oh, so I've tried all my tricks in the book. What do I do next? I'm at my... Uh, help! That's because you're trying the same old pattern over and over again. You're trying the same old 
this and the same old that and it goes on and on and it never changes because you're not used to it you're not outside of your envelope you're not using your intuition and so what I wrote back which is interesting because you know nobody acknowledges it and and yeah I'm a little bit miffed about it because of the fact that you don't these, these trainers are not recognizing the fact that dogs have a psychology that's the thing like even in the in the in the in the, in the post itself there's no name of the dog. There's no nothing. There's no identification. There's no pronouning. There's no individualization of the dog. There's no respect. So right off the bat, the trainer's already said, no, this dog's stupid, and I don't know what to do with him, but he's a stupid dog. That's literally what they're saying. And I might be harsh about it, but it's because that's the way the society is in regards to this suppressed dog training industry. So what I wrote back in regards to dog peeing and so forth like that, because there's so many variables, and it's obviously beyond their, uh, it's obviously beyond, uh, thank you, Crystal. Um, it's obviously beyond their capacity to understand that dogs have a sentience, that dogs have emotions, that dogs have feelings. So I wrote down this. Their dog is marking due to insecurities, likely, so, uh, likely low self-esteem, uh, sorry, uh, likely low self-confidence, secondary is low self-esteem, the marking is psychosomatic. That's really what it is. It's a psychological behavior that's addressing, uh, that, that's why the dog is urinating inside the home. Outside the home, it's a whole bunch of other issues. So I wrote down the four different options that could be the case. One, if the dog was a rescue, I would fathom his last owner was a single person that did everything with their dog. Two, if the dog is peeing when the owner is gone, when the owner is outside of the house, then it's a codependency dysfunction. Three, if the dog is peeing when the owner is home and out of view, then it's a fear issue rooted in abandonment or abuse. And four, if the dog is peeing in the home in front of the owner, then it's a latent codependency issue. So I'll try to get this as quick as I can because I'm running out of battery time here. So the first thing is if the dog was a rescue, as I said earlier, you don't know what the history is. Going to have to try to figure out what the dog's history was by the behavior and the way the dog is connected to their human being. So it's that part of, okay, well, was a person a single person or not? Because the way the, the poster, the trainer has posted is they're talking about the owner only. So we decipher what the, what the trainer's words are being used. And the way the trainer describes the owner and the predicament gives me an idea of, of what the trainer themselves is like. So on a scale from me, you know, I, uh, I'm, you know, from V3, which is a dog that has some sort of dysfunction and so forth, to a V6, which is the same as Dr. Ian Dunbar's ridiculously rhetorical scale of a dog kills somebody or kills an animal that dog can't be fixed and must be killed. And then a V10, which is a dog that has predatory intent to stalk, trap, and kill human beings. Over 150 pounds, must have attacked at least 12 people. These people don't have any idea what they're talking about. And this trainer, by the way they described it, is probably around a V3, maybe a V4 level with treats. Um, so it's that part of going past the treat reliance, going past the experience and saying, I want to figure out what's going on with the dog. How do I figure out what's going on with the dog? I figure out if the dog has psychological issues and how do I figure that out? And because people don't see dogs as living, breathing beings, they just don't see that, oh, the dog is a dog. There's no name, there's no nothing on it. So then it's a disenfranchisement from the trainer's side of who this dog is because there's no more any personalization whatsoever. So the one thing is, again, from her, what she said, as, as I'm inferring that, again, the dog was a single owner situation and the insecurity comes from that. So then I go to the point of number two is if the dog is peeing when the owner is gone, then it's codependency dysfunction, which means the dog can't help by themselves. They can't handle being by themselves and they, they feel insecure and so forth and they're feeling insecure with the home aspect and they're not familiar with the home as well and the various rooms of the home, etc. And then the dog urinates out of that dysfunction. The other one then is number three. If the dog is peeing when the owner is home and out of view, then it's a fear issue rooted in, 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 it's a fear issue rooted in abandonment or abuse. And so what that means then is that the dog itself he himself herself whatever self because we don't know the name the dog himself is not feeling comfortable when the owner's home which means that there is an overabundance of attempts to have the dog like them desperation and attempts to have the dog connect to them 
and not understanding, which means it's basically like somebody, you know, if you're going out, if you're going out with somebody and that person just keeps buying you gifts all the time, keeps buying you gifts, AKA treats and so forth, keeps buying you gifts and gifts, you eventually get to the point that you feel like, you know, I don't think this person respects me or understands me because all they're trying to do is buy my love. So that's where the dysfunction of the counterintuitive aspect, you know, treats, food, none of that exists as a communication device in the canine species at all. And I challenge any animal behaviorist, any PhD behaviorist, any, any, any academic to disprove that fact that nowhere in the canine species does food exist as a communication tool, much less a reward fiat. So uh, the dog peeing outside, etc., like that, the dog peeing inside the home, these are all aspects of dysfunctions that are rooted in the relationship between the dog and the human being because the dog wouldn't be peeing in the home when the human's gone. So that's that part. So number four, if the dog is peeing in the home in front of the owner, then it's a latent codependency issue. And what that means then is that the dog is feeling comfortable somewhat with the owner, but is still feeling insecure, meaning that the dog has low self-esteem. The dog doesn't know how to process what's going on, wants to have an affectation and an emotional context of relationship with their dog, but doesn't know how to do so. I mean, with their human, but doesn't know how to do so. So then the dog themselves is exhibiting that aspect of somewhat insecurity and desperation through that latent codependency and then thus peeing in front of the owner. It goes on a lot deeper. Uh, each one is an individual aspect, but you see this part. The, the, the post was, the dog pees everywhere. It used to be aggressive and used to be insecure, or no, uh, aggressive and territorial. And now that we've got that under the control and now the dog is just peeing. But there's no details. So we don't know the details. How do you expect to decipher the problem? And that's a limitation of the trainer. That's why a V3, maybe a V4 at the most with treats. And that's the inexperience. And that's what ends up killing dogs. When you don't know what the heck you're doing and you don't care to listen or learn from anybody or anything else. And that problem becomes disruptive in the sense that you then start propagating that information to the rest of the owners and people. The worst part is when you have somebody who, you know, for example, writes a newspaper column here in Vancouver and, uh, you know, starts going after other people and so forth like that, saying that they know what they're talking about, but then they have, hey, man, Hey Blake, then they don't know what they're doing. And it is the blind leading the blind. You're talking to people who only are successful with 60% of the dogs that are dysfunctional. The other 40%, these people kill. The behaviors, the trainers, those people who are so willing to say that this dog needs to be killed for behavioral euthanasia, and then they discount it. And that's the worst that that is the sin. That is the sin is what they're doing to the dogs because now then they go off the next person and say well you know what in my experience this dog can't be helped i've had other dogs those dogs can't be helped etc etc and then they go back and they sit in their gucci high heels and they go off to the next person and they make two three hundred thousand dollars a year and they're just killing dogs left right and center just disgusting um okay so all that part goes on to that post is why Whenever I have someone contacting me, I ask them to send me clear photos of their dog's eyes, face, and body so I get a sense of them. So I get their history as well from the owner, the family. I get their overall issues. But I ask for photos. And if you go to my website, rfarfbarkbark.com, go on the tag that says help for your dogs, you'll read the screenshots of the posts of owners that I have read their descriptions, never talked to them, never met them in person, nothing at all, read their descriptions and looked at the photos of their dog and have given them an accuracy of psychological evaluation you will never ever get from anyone else in the world and that's a guarantee. The depth of what I read dogs at is the same depth that you yourselves can achieve. So please understand what I do, I might be the teacher, you can learn how to do it yourself and the people who have hired me, like Pedro and so forth like that, they have learned to do so themselves. So it's not magic that I'm doing. It's just really super simple. And I'm not here trying to make my ego or arrogance and so forth. I'm just really trying to help dogs. I'm just trying to get this dog industry, the behaviors, the academics, those who are writing textbooks, etc., to understand that they're, they're going along the incorrect path. 
Um, you know, I said mentioned earlier, and, and Stephen Elliott's probably going to be listening to this again. Uh, I mentioned earlier, and him and I have had discussion about Temple Grandin, and she again is you know one of the top hundred influential people voted or, or considered by Time Magazine. Her error in her work, and I know she's with Tufts University, etc. Her error in her work is the fact that she's autistic, and she freely admits that she's autistic. And what she says, hey Pedro, and what she says is that animals behave like autistic people. And again, she's forgetting the fact that the sophistication of the human brain far exceeds that of the dog or the cow. So she's gone on an incorrect path and she's just continued blindly down that path. And then people go, oh my gosh, she's amazing because she's given us some sort of insight. But when it comes to, to cows, when it comes to dogs, she doesn't understand what's going on. No, you can't you can't say that. Sorry, man. Can't say that. Um, I do everything uh, that I work with with dogs. The predators, you see them in, in my videos and all that stuff. Nothing with a treat. We're reading the dog at that speed. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, thanks, Blake. Um, so what it is is how many times have you looked at your dog and went, you know what? I kind of thought they were going to be like this. Oh, yeah, I can hear the strain in their voice. Oh, wait, I can see they're up to no good. That's that intuition that I'm saying that you all have. Use that intuition. Follow what I'm saying. Look at the fact that what I'm doing has been successful 100% of the time. Not one single trainer or behaviors can ever say they have been able to work with the dogs that I do, but they could learn and some have contacted me and said, hey, you know what, man? I can't publicly say who I am with you because you know people already don't like you, James but I would love to learn what's going on so you can help me. And you'll see those guys starting to go on to be rock stars because now they're getting this incredible depth with their dogs that they never thought of before. And I don't mind being in the shadow because they're saving lives. So getting back to the part about asking for photos. The reason why I ask for photos is so I get a sense of your dog. So what does that mean? Well, here it is. When you decided to go adopt your dog or buy your dog from a breeder, you looked at your dog's picture. You looked at a hundred different pictures. You fell in love with that dog. The dog that you adopted into your home, that's a dog you fell in love with. And how did you fall in love with that dog of yours? By looking at a hundred pictures and went, you know what? Out of a hundred pictures, that one dog is the one that hit me right here in my soul. That's your intuition. So when I look at your dog's picture, that's exactly what I believe in. When I look at those photos and you, again, look at my website and you'll see my accuracy is 100% and I'm reading personalities of people's dogs that they're just like, how did you even know? It's the same thing that you yourselves can do. And so it's another part, for example, you know, I go on like Tinder and, and, and Bumble and all that stuff and I look at pictures of women. I'm looking for pictures in their faces and the way they look and the way they hold their eyes. What do they look like? How do they seem? What kind of energy? What kind of personality? What kind of feeling do I get that hit that I get off of them? Is it someone that I feel kind of satiates my soul in that sense of it? Same thing when you are out there, for those of you who are single, when you're out there looking for someone as well. You're, you're going through the pictures. You're scrolling through the pictures. You're scrolling through the pictures. And you stop at one picture of one uh, woman or man that just goes, oh, you know what? I like her. And then you decide to click, swipe right, whatever it is. That's that connection. Same thing with your dog. That's that connection. Same thing if your friend sends you a picture of, of your you know your brother and says, Hey, you know what? Look at your brother. He was about to play a joke on somebody. And then you take a look at that picture just moments before he was about to do that joke. You go, yeah, I can tell by the look in his eyes and the way he holds his mouth. He had that look in his face, etc. That's what I do with dogs. You can tell by the way the dog's de physical development is. The psychological stress on the dog has affected the way they look. Same thing as it does on a human being. You can tell by the way the dog holds their body, by the way the dog walks. All that behavior is indicative of the dog's personality. Next time you watch your dog and you see what they do, think back and track back all the steps that that dog did before they did what they did. Then you think about it. It's called, essentially, accident reconstruction. You walk back, and then you figure out what it was that happened. And from there, you do that with your dog on and on and on and on. And I talked about um, somebody else who contacted me, and they mentioned intermediate bridging, which I had to look up. But it's that part, again, let your intuition fly. 
to when you have somebody, you know, because if you're not in Vancouver, Canada, you need somebody to have training and so forth. I have a closed group. You're welcome to join. Everybody's welcome to join on that part. Um, there's never any talk about euthanasia. Absolutely no allowance for euthanasia when there's a behavioral issue, unless it's a medical issue that is uh, extreme or moderate, um, above moderate, then, you know, then there's that aspect like epilepsy and, and tumors and so forth but anything else from that, okay? Um, but yeah, so look at the photos. Next time you talk to your trainer or behavior, say, hey, you know what, this is my issue with my dog, da, da, da. See how long the trainer or behaviorist goes without asking you for the name of your dog. See how long that trainer or behaviorist goes without asking you for photos of your dog. How do you expect to know anything about a dog if you don't look at their photos? Because then what you're saying is, if you're not looking at the, if the trainer's not looking at the photo, if they're not looking at the, the, the pictures of the dog, then who are they talking about? Are they just saying that every dog is exactly the same? That's correct. They're saying every dog is exactly the same. I look at the photo so I get the individualization, then I understand the personality of the dog, then I go from there. Um... So that's going to be uh, the end of my uh, my broadcast today. I want to keep things shorter. I want to keep things as more detailed versus too much. You know, I, again, I've had people tell me I'm saying too much information for them. And if I could please simplify it, so simpl simplify simplify it, and I will do so as much as I can. I am taking everyone's feedback. I look at everyone's comments. And then I go from there. And it's all taken with respect. You can say whatever you like to me. Ask that um, you know, just do what you can. Anyways, um, please share my posts. Please help me get my word out so that the rest of society can understand the dog training community can understand that the dog is deeper than just the dog. We want to be able to give life to things that are going out there. Thank you so much. Have a great night. And I hope to, uh, you know, talk about something cool tomorrow as well. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.